I've been preaching this same kind of thing out of this uh, chapter for, for a number of years, for many years. And, um, but <clears throat> this specifically um, has a lot of spiritual warfare in it. And uh, we're going to look at that this afternoon. And uh, you probably have, maybe some of you have notes on it, notes in your Bible. But uh, the, basic, the basic message, the title is Seven Steps to Spiritual Success. That's uh, you know, a little bit of alliteration there for you. But we start here in, uh, in verse 16 of Thessalon 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5 is where we're going to be at. And we're going to read uh, these verses together. And it says, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophecies. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. <clears throat> abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray your whole uh, spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ faithful is he that calleth you also who also will do it brethren pray for us I, uh, I greet all the brethren with a holy kiss I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come today, we come in the name of Jesus. So grateful and thankful for all that you've done and all your blessings upon us. Thank you for the services today and pray that you'd continue to bless this afternoon. I pray in the name of Jesus and bind anything that would try and cause hindrance, any spirits of false doctrine, any false antichrist or spirits of error. Lord, any of these things that would, uh, would uh, prevent people from hearing the truth or hearing the gospel, we bind in the name of Jesus. We bind spirits of Ahab and Jezebel. We bind spirits of Asmodeus, Osmodeus, and Orion. Lord, we also bind the spirits of witchcraft and spirits of uh, bondage. And well, Lord, we loose upon each one the spirit of adoption, the spirit of Elijah, of truth, of love, of power, of sound mind. Lord, the grace and peace of the Lord be upon us all today. Lord, help us and just let us feel your presence and pray the Holy Spirit of God would move freely. And Lord, we yield to you in all things that you would have us to do. Let it be for your honor and glory. We pray for anyone who does not know Jesus as a Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for that, those watching, those that is here, uh, that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, we're so grateful and so thankful. Bless us now and help us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So here we have the first thing he says. He says, rejoice evermore. Now, when we come to spiritual work, when we come to a spiritual life, we have a physical life and we have a spiritual life. When we come to that, there are some important steps there's important things that we need to grasp in our in our, our, our our warfare. When we get saved, we enlist in a battle. There's no question about it. It's a spiritual battle. There always has been a spiritual battle since since Satan's rebellion. There's been a spiritual battle. There was a spiritual battle in the Garden of Eden. There was a spiritual battle in Noah's day. There was a spiritual battle all the way through, even in the, the time of the Israelites and in Egypt. There was a spiritual battle, not just physical battles, but spiritual battles. And what's to say that today should be any different? And we all know that we're in a spiritual battle. That's why God gives us the whole armor of God. That's why he tells us and, and wants to train us up in the way that we should so that we, when, we, when we decide who we're going to fight for, is it doesn't matter, you know, <clears throat> there are people born of other countries who fight for a, an adopted nation, you know, and like uh, people that are born in that country fight against that nation. Mm -hmm. And we find that in the Christian life too, that there are people who are born again but still live like the devil, and they, they don't fight for God's kingdom, which is very, very sad. So here are some steps that we can look and we can apply to our lives to um, help us in our spiritual walk, and especially in our and to have spiritual success. You know, spiritual success is not dependent on how many people we see saved. Spiritual success is not dependent on numbers. It's dependent on quality, not quantity. The Bible tells us that we'll be judged by Christ of what sort. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, uh, it'll be of what sort it is. We'll all give an account and everybody will try what sort it is. It's not about how much there is, but what sort. When we take the example of the good and faithful servants, we find that, uh, that they, they, they were tried of what sort it is. So, sort it was. Both of them doubled their money. Now one brought five talents extra, mm -hmm. one brought two talents extra, but they both had doubled what they had. So the sort was that they had doubled what they were given. And that was it. Had the one with two talents brought three talents, 
he would have been more faithful than the one that had five, even though the one that had brought five had two more talents. They would have been more than double what he brought. So when God looks at us, he doesn't judge us by numbers. He doesn't judge us by the quantity of what things are. It's the quality of what it is. And that is the key, is the quality of these things. Now, the first thing we find here is rejoice evermore. This is, why is this first? Because we have to understand what rejoicing is. Rejoicing is not just generally being happy. People can be happy by doing a lot of things. People, people can be happy by taking drugs, by getting drunk, by these kind of things. People can get happy. They can enjoy a happiness for a, a, brief, a brief bit of time. They can enjoy what they claim as happiness. People can, can um, um, join in with lewd and perverse behavior and be happy for a time. But that's not what rejoicing is. Rejoicing is something that we can continue to do even though we may be sad, we can rejoice. And you say, how can we rejoice in a sad time? The Bible tells us that we rejoice because our names are written in heaven. Jesus told the disciples in Luke chapter 10, in verse 19, he said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So the serpents and the scorpions there, we know, are not, not necessarily literal, but are spiritual. Mm -hmm. Because he says, and over all the power of the enemy. So over the serpents and the scorpions, over the, de uh, the demons and the fallen angels, and also over the enemy. And then he says, and rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but your names are written in heaven. So he's, he's, he's saying, you know, thank God for these things. Rejoice. Yeah that we are written in heaven, and our names are not blotted out. You know, the Bible tells us as well in Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say, rejoice. He says, rejoice. You know, Psalms talks about rejoicing, rejoicing. Rejoicing is not being happy. Rejoicing is rejoicing in the Lord because of what God has done, not because of what we have done. You can be happy for a time, but when we realize God's deliverance, when we realize that our names are written in heaven and that we are going to heaven and that we will be uh, that we are saved and that we will be saved from hell that is something to rejoice at Amen. so it doesn't matter what's going on it doesn't matter what is happening outside what is happening we know that when this life is passed we have eternal life that is something to rejoice in that that's something to rejoice in the fact that we know that we can be secure in that fact. That's something to rejoice. That we don't have to wonder, well, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I wonder if I've been good enough to get to heaven. That's, that's not, there's not in the Bible. It's not my works. God tells us we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. There's no amount of works that we can do to attain, attain righteousness enough to enter into heaven. Our righteousness, yes, is the righteousness of the saints. The Bible says it's pure and white, and our good works count for our righteousness. But even if we look back to Abraham's time, he believed God. And not his works. It was his belief, his faith, that saved him. It was the faith that saved people. He said, thy faith hath made thee whole. Not your works, but your faith. And so when we talk about rejoicing in a spiritual warfare, we might be beaten down. We might be trodden down. We might be one of the lowest points we've ever been. But when we start to think, hey, you know what? God loves me. God hasn't stopped loving me. God will continue to love me. Mm. And that one day I'm going to be with him. Amen. Amen. And be with him forever. How can you not rejoice about that? He said, well, I just lost my job. God still loves you. you know? We can still rejoice no matter what comes our way. And that's something to get hold of. The devil wants to steal your joy. He wants you to be at that point in your life where you're miserable and that you have nothing. And that's where the devil wants to keep you. There, which is why when you're miserable, you're susceptible to drink and to drugs and to all kinds of things to appease the flesh, to help the flesh cope with what's going on. 
But God says, come, ye that are laden, heavy laden, burden heavy laden. I will take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. You know, meek and lowly. Uh, you know, my burden's easy, and my, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God said, I'm not quoting it exactly right. But he said, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Mm -hmm. Take my yoke upon you. I will give you rest. I kind of quote the song rather than quoting the Bible there. But, um, but he says, give it to, to, give it to Jesus. So the first thing we need to know is if we are saved, if we know that we're saved and know that our sins are paid for, our sins are then forgiven as well. And that we have that gift of salvation that can never be taken away from us. We can rejoice evermore in whatever circumstances we are in. Whether it is a loss or a sickness or whatever it is, we can rejoice because our names are written in heaven. If our names are not written in heaven, if you're not saved, then you cannot rejoice. Because what do you have to rejoice about? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He comes on and then says, pray without ceasing. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Now a lot of people say, well, does that mean we have to constantly pray through, you know, all the time? Or, you know, do we get like, uh, you know, all these people that are just constantly praying and they get the call to prayer? And that's not what it means. Pray without ceasing is to continue in a mindset of prayer. And I'll give you this example that I've used many times before, and I think it really fits this. That suppose you're driving, how many has been in a car with someone on a long, long journey? Now, a long journey, I'm talking about five, six hours, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, all right, you've been on a long journey. Did you speak the whole way? No. There's some times where you just, you just had enough. You know, it's just like, wished. Um, you know. You just, you just, some people speak the whole way and sometimes it gets tiring and you know but what happens is you 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 get to a point where you both stop talking in the front seat now at any point when you stop talking do you think well where did the other person go no you're always conscious that the other person is still there yes mm -hmm. and so when you if you maybe you could maybe go an hour with not talking but then as soon as you 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 start to talk again the conversation starts again. You're always conscious that that person is there. It's kind of like that, that instance that you're not talking to God constantly. You're not constantly praying, but you're conscious that God is there and that perhaps there might be a word. Now, we don't always have to go to God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Like You know, God never told us to pray like that. Anybody that prays like that is missing the point of what Jesus said. I will not repeat the Lord's Prayer. It, it, when I go to churches and stuff and they say, let's all say the Lord's Prayer together, our Father who art in heaven, I won't do it. Because it's a vain repetition. And Jesus just told us that that's vain repetition. He says, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. He said, after this manner pray ye, after this type pray ye. And he gives us six ways, six points in our prayers. He says, praise first, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, praise be thy name, right? He tells us to pray for, for God's will here to be done. He talks about praying for others. He talks about then taking care of sin, provide provisions for our needs. You know, give us this day our daily bread. Well, that's it. That's all you need, your daily bread. What about the money for your electric bills? What about the, the milk that go along with the bread because it's snowing? Um, what about all the other stuff that you need? Be specific in your prayer. You know, if we think that the Lord's Prayer is that, and Jesus never prayed that prayer, he said, this is how to pray. And it kind of irritates me when people call it the Lord's Prayer because it's not the Lord's Prayer, it's the model prayer. It's how Jesus taught us to pray. We should never, ever pray that prayer. So I won't do it. If, if people ask me in church, to, or people in church, a lot of them do it. It's just vain repetition that means nothing. It's just, it, it's, it really is, is nothing. Uh, yes, it is scripture, but that is how we are, the, the manner in which we are to pray. And so he tells us we don't always have to pray that for an hour. We can talk to God in prayer. We can, if we're just talking to God, 
well, Lord, what do you think about this? Should I do this? Should I do that? No, we can ask God a question. We don't say, Our Father who art in heaven, thou be glorious in things, and thou knowest all things, and we come to thee today to ask of thee thy petition to do this certain thing that we wish to do. Now, the thing that we wish to do, we don't know if it's your will that we wish to do it. So if we wish to do it and thine don't wish to do it, would you please answer us now? You got all that, didn't you? Lord, should I do this? When we pray all these highfalutin prayers, it kind of puts God away from us. But God wants us to, you know, give us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In other words, Daddy, Daddy, Abba. Abba is, the, Ab, Abba is a, you know, it comes from the word Ab, which means Father. So Abba is a term that we would like, we would say Daddy. That's what God wants us to be. And, you know, you would never go to your earthly father and say, Father, I wish to do such and such, and I know that your will might not be for me to do such and such, but if I were to do such and such, it wouldn't be your will for me to conveniently do that. Perhaps mine and mine friends are wishing to go and visit the, the pizzeria, uh, commonly called Domino's. And now I will need some, some of the monetary value notes uh, to be able to purchase said dough product with uh, with pineapple and other said vegetables or you could say hey dad can i have some money to go to dominoes <laughs> <laughs> you see see what we do people want to distance ourselves from god and that's the devil wants to distance you from god god is our father he is our daddy if we're saved that is mm -hmm. and so we we yes we need to give him respect absolutely give him respect and there's a time and a place where we get alone and we praise god and we thank him for what he's doing and we do that but there's other times where we just say you know god i really need a hug <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's what he's there for um, that's one of the many reasons he's there waiting for us to do that so when we're praying it without ceasing, it's not a case that we're spending all day in prayer. It's a case that we can go and we're conscious that whatever we need, we can go to the Lord. If you need protection, let me ask you this. When Peter was sinking, did he say, Oh, thou Lord, I am but a worm and I am sinking down deeper. By that time he was, done. what did he say? Three words. Lord save me and what did jesus do well I'll think about it immediately it says he caught him yeah. not. was that a prayer did peter pray mm -hmm. absolutely it's a communication between him and god he said lord save me so you see our prayer is often hindered by our own knowledge our own wisdom we want to try and put all these things in it and sometimes our prayers are hindered when a simple prayer is what is required lord save me mm -hmm. especially in a spiritual warfare situation know that we can go to god and say god help me god help me lord help me and god is immediately according to the bible it says that he stretched forth his hand and again i believe as well as when one of god's children is in dire need of help and he says god save me god help me god immediately puts forth his hand and helps us mm -hmm. immediately <clears throat> can i experience that yesterday on the bus <laughs> yeah. he then says in everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you it's very difficult to give thanks for every situation When you get a bill for six hundred pound, you only get three hundred pound in your bank account. Can you be thankful to God in that situation? You think, well, how can we be thankful? Well, we can thank God that He's going to supply the money to pay it, Amen. and be very grateful when He does. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in First Corinthians, uh, in verse sixteen and forty-one, it says to give thanks to the Lord because His mercy endureth forever. In Psalm 136, verse 26, 41 times it says, Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endureth forever is mentioned 41 times. How can we give thanks to God? 
because his mercy endures forever. I mean, that's something great to be thankful for, is it not? Amen. When we think about how, how God's mercy is upon us, we think, wow, what great things God has done. His mercy endures. His mercy, his mercy means he's still able to save and still wants to save and still is merciful to those that will call upon his name. <clears throat> and in a warfare situation, when the disciples were beaten up, they went away glorifying God, praising God that they were worthy to have suffered at the hand of God. They were thanking God that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ's sake. What did that mean? It, mean that they, that it meant that they knew that were, they were doing right. They were doing for God because the world hates us. When the world starts slamming us and the world starts coming against us, we can be thankful because it means that the world doesn't love us. The world doesn't like us. Because if the world likes us and the world accepts us, well then we can't be too much like Christ. Because why? Jesus said if the world, the world hates him, if it's accepted of the world, it's probably not of God. So if the world doesn't accept us, be thankful because it means you're more like Christ than you thought you were. Mm -hmm. But if the world is accepting you, then you have to say, well, wait a minute. It must not be exactly like Christ because the world is uh, the world's accepting me. He comes on and says, then quench not the spirit. This is the only time this is mentioned in the Bible. And a lot of people get this get this all twisted out of court, uh, out of uh, proportion, out of context. It simply says, "Quench not the spirit." The also point in the Bible says, "Grieve not the spirit." So it means that the Holy Spirit has our character. To be grieved, to be able to be grieved, means that he has to have a personage. You know, you cannot be grieved and have no emotions. You cannot have a personage and not. And that you cannot, if, if you don't have a personage, you cannot be grieved. So he is real. He is the third person of the Trinity. And he can be grieved and he can be quenched. What does the word quench mean? There's two, two definitions of the word quench. To put out is one. The second one? Hmm? To put out. Yeah. Put down. Yeah, to put out, to put down. Yeah. What else? What else can you quench? You can quench a fire and you can also quench thirst. Exactly. You can quench a thirst. Yeah. Right? You can, you can, it can, it can be dry. Uh, it can be done. But to quench is to put out. It usually involves water. Right? When we quench something, we put it out. Now, there's two ways we can put something out. We can put out a fire or we can put something out of the church. And we can look at that the same way as we can quench the spirit and say the spirit cannot work. Um, and when we don't want the spirit to work and we allow another spirit to work it's very difficult for the spirit and so we quench the Holy Spirit by allowing other spirits to work in our lives or in our churches and so that's why it's so important to bind anything else that would try and cause problems to qu quench to, to quench the other spirits to bind the other spirits and loose the Holy Spirit <coughs> so that we don't quench him there are many false prophets in the world today Many, many ones, many false doctrines, many things this way. Doctrines of devils, the Bible says, especially in the last days, as we can see we're upon. Mm -hmm. And it's so important these days that we do not quench the Holy Spirit from working in our lives or in our churches. You know, that we don't just go ahead with what we have been fed, what we've been told, but that we study everything out to its fullest conclusion. You know, we cannot look at the scriptures and say, well, that says this, but logically, logic doesn't fit. Our logic is not God's logic. We must look at what the scripture says. And does the Bible say that? You know, I get people knocking on my door. Well, they didn't knock on my door the other day. They kind of just took a wide berth around me. I'm like, woo, praise the Lord. But they're knocking at everybody else's door. So I saw them. So I started binding those spirits. And, um, you know, people just wouldn't open the doors to them. And, uh, you know, they, they come and, and, uh, we, you ask them these questions, and, and this, you're, yes, you might be right in a few things, but you're listening to the wrong spirit. Listening to a different spirit. It's a different spirit that's controlling you. 
And this is so important that we, we learn to discern between these spirits. And we put away our own understandings. And we stick to the Bible because there's so many works that people have done that people base doctrines on this book and not on the Bible. Like I said this morning, it's okay to read books written by men or by women. But when you start using that book as your source of doctrine, mm -hmm. that means you're under a false spirit. Yeah. And we start elevating that person up to prophethood. Mm -hmm. But there are no prophets since this was finished. Anybody else that calls them a prophet outside this book is a liar. Because I guarantee it. You say, how can you know that? Because I guarantee that they will have a false prophecy. Every person that's claimed to be a prophet since John, mm -hmm. since the Apostle John finished the book of Revelation, has proven to be a false prophet. Every single one of them. Every one of them has had prophecies that did not come true. People say, Jesus is coming back in such and such time. He didn't come back. They said they were doing this. And a lot of them concern the coming of the Lord. But we find that anybody that claims to be a prophet, unless they're 100% accurate, they're a false prophet. And so we must examine these people and realize that a lot of these people that claim to be prophets are not. Are not. And certainly no apostles, that's for sure. There, God may give unto a person a, a gift of prophecy that they can prophesy about a certain thing. But again, that doesn't make them a prophet. It means that God gave them a word of knowledge. You know, that happened to me several years ago when I was packing away our Christmas tree. And the Lord said to me, he said, this is the last year you'll be putting this up. And I didn't know what that what really meant. And I, but I heard the Lord say, this is the last year you'll put it up. And why would I even think about that? And sure enough, that year we learnt the true meaning of Christmas. And we learnt about its pagan roots of the Christmas tree. And we learned how the, the Christmas tree was, 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 a, was a pagan symbol and nothing to do with Jesus. And sure enough, that was the last time we put it up. Because the next thing, the next time I got it out, it went to the dump. They've never put one up since. So God's prophecy came true, 100%. It was, it was never put up again. So God can give us a word of knowledge in that way, but um, these things... But when we come to quenching the Spirit, we must make sure that we are in agreement, that we agree together, as the Bible said, where two or three are gathered. If two or three agree in, in His name, or gather in His name, or two agree touching anything, it will be done. And so we agree to bind the things that are, are of, of Satan and loose the things that are of God. So we do not quench the Spirit. We do not hinder Him from working, and we do not put Him out of our churches. But so many churches today have put the Holy Spirit out, and they've replaced Him. They've replaced him with logic or replaced him with man's theology and are no longer led of the Spirit. They've replaced him with, with, um, with um, schedules, you know, to where this must be done in this order and that has to be done. That never happened in the Bible. People didn't have schedules there that, you know, first hymn will go this and this, the second hymn, then we'll pray and then we'll have an offering and, and da da da. There's no leadership of the Spirit there. If the Spirit can't be in charge, then we've quenched Him. It's mm -hmm. very, very, very simple. So we must not quench the Spirit, especially if we're talking about warfare and deliverance. He's got to be the forefront because He's the one that's going to reveal to us what Spirit we're coming against, mm -hmm. you know, and how we're to come against it. The Holy Spirit reveals to us knowledge that we can possibly know. You know, we've had that several times when we've been counseling and we've been doing deliverance. The Holy Spirit will give us a word and, and with our, our word of knowledge or whatever it is. And um, we'll ask the person, say, what, what does this mean to you? And they're like, whoa, I completely forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not divination. That's the Holy Spirit revealing something to set this person free. Mm -hmm. and, we, and then we take care of that. And it's maybe, you know, some, you know and the Holy Spirit mentions, oh, I'll tell you what, they did such and such. And we're like, ah, it's unforgiveness. You have unforgiveness toward this person. The Holy Spirit will reveal that to us. The Bible tells us He'll teach us all these things. Jesus said, you not, need not that anyone teach you, but the Holy Spirit will teach you these things. And again, just what we're talking about prophecies, He says, despise not prophecies. You know, the Scriptures tells us that all Scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16 is given by inspiration of God. 
These scriptures that we have are inspired by God. Anything outside this Bible is not inspired by God. It may have been, it may have been, have an inspiration, but it's not by God's mouth. It is not classified as canon of scripture. There's a lot of things, such as the Apocrypha. There might be things in there that, sure enough, they were written by holy men of God. And I have to say that I cannot believe that Daniel only wrote 12 or 13 chapters, if you include the Apocrypha. I'm sure he, read, he wrote far, far more than he did. But we don't have it in the canon of Scripture, so it's not needed for us today. But everything God has included in the Bible is for our benefit. You know, all the way through the Old Testament to now, everything that God has written is for our benefit. He said, well, we may not have, need to do everything that the Old Testament says. Well, that's very true. We might not have to do everything, but it's there to show us why it was there and what it was for. So don't despise any part of the Word. Don't despise any part of God's Word. You know, well, that's for the Jews. That's for such and such. No, it says it's all profitable. People say, well, I don't like that part of Scripture. Well, too bad, because it's all profitable. He tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15, to study to show thyself approved unto God. We're not to study to show ourselves approved unto men, but study to show ourselves unto, approved unto God, uh, to be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Then he says, but shun profane and vain mablings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. He then comes on to say, prove all things, and hold fast to that which is good. Here's the crux. Prove all things. When we have something in the scriptures, we must prove it. We must test it. We must test everything mm -hmm. that we hear about. Anything that someone says, we must test it along with the scriptures. Right? He says in 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. You know, um, in Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And Acts 17, 11 tells us about the men of Berea that were more nobler than them of Thessalonica. That they certainly received the word with all readiness of mind, so they're ready to receive it. And it says, And they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So these men didn't have a computer to go and search out these things, nor did they have any of the New Testament. But everything that was preached concerning Jesus was studied out of the Old Testament, the Tanakh and the Torah. Mm -hmm. So you can find a lot of these things. If you find a doctrine in the New Testament that does not have its basis in the Old Testament, you better throw it out. Mm -hmm. If you can't find it in the Old Testament, you throw it out. You say, what about the rapture? That's in the Old Testament. Daniel talks about it in the Old Testament. What about the second coming of Christ? In the Old Testament, the Bible tells us, Zechariah and Ezekiel tells us he's going to come down, set his foot on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in two, and he's going to march into Jerusalem and take up the throne and set up his kingdom. The Old Testament tells us these things. But what people do is they pull out doctrines from the New Testament that have no foundation in the Old Testament. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. God set up the Old Testament so that when the New Covenant came along, we could see that it's all based on that. Mm -hmm. Salvation, baptism, works of righteousness, all based on the Old Testament. The works of righteousness as in what we do after we're saved, mm -hmm. not to be saved. Let me clarify that. All these things, and again, if you can't find it in the Old Testament, don't even bring it up because it's not there. If you've got a doctrine from the New Testament that you cannot prove from the Old Testament, that's not a doctrine of God. Everything God has done is set up from the Old Testament. It's got to be there. So you've got to prove it. How can you prove it? By going to the Old Testament and seeing the parallel of it. By seeing the parallel of both these things. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. You know? Nothing new under the sun. So we must look at context. We must look at all these things and we must prove it to see whether these things are so. Now, if they could prove it out of the Old Testament, the preaching of Christ, his resurrection, the baptism, all these things, if they could see it out of the Old Testament, then it must be so. And we can see that. Even the promise of the Holy Spirit was promised in the Old Testament. All these things were promised there that we see revealed now in the New Testament. And then finally he said, abstain from all appearance of evil. 
I like this because <coughs> abstain from all appearance of evil. The Bible says in Psalm 1, 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 18, to flee fornication. Uh, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, flee from idolatry. In, for, in 2 Timothy 2, 22, he says, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness. So we can see, flee fornication, flee from idolatry, and flee youthful rust, lusts. But there's another flee. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Mm-hmm. From sin we must flee. Yeah. But when we resist it, we're, when we, we've uh, submitted ourselves to God and we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Why? Because we're, we're, <coughs> we're doing these. When we say abstain, abstain from all appearance of evil, it's what looks to be evil. Not just necessarily what is evil, but what looks to be evil. If we look at something and say that looks evil, stay for, stay from stay away from it. Mm-hmm. Stay away from it. If it looks evil, stay away from it. Right. Don't mess with it. Don't go near it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Mm-hmm. If you're doing something that somebody else looks upon and they think, well, that looks evil, stay away from it. We've got to be careful in our Christian walk that we don't give the enemy any way to catch us out because it will what what someone appears to be evil someone will take and say they were doing such and such no 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 well that's what it appeared like mm-hmm. yeah i've told you this story before about the preacher who was preaching on alcohol and a friend that used to come by and stop coming to see him and he said why he said because you're a hypocrite and he said what are you talking about he said you're preaching against drinking alcohol but yeah i came by and i saw you with two wine glasses and a bottle of wine in your window he said, no, I can assure you that we weren't, that there's no way we were drinking alcohol. I preached against alcohol. He said, well, I saw it with my own eyes. I saw a bottle of wine and two wine glasses there on your windowsill. Turned out it was a bottle of Schlor. It wasn't alcohol, but it was in wine glasses. And it certainly looked like it was wine. And anybody from a distance would see a wine bottle because Schlor looks like it's a wine bottle. That's why I don't buy it. It's really nice juice. And if somebody, you know, has poured it out and, you know, but I'll say, give me it in a tumbler, <laughs> you know. But if you put something that is in a wine bottle into a wine glass and it looks like wine, what are you going to do? Somebody's going to think, hey, you're drinking wine, you know. That's why usually if, you know, if, if we're at a, a meal or something like that, I'll always, I won't order apple juice because it looks like, it tends to look like other things. I'll make sure it's orange so that people, you know, cl- clear what, uh, what it is. Isn't that right, son? You made that mistake <laughs> when he was at my mother's wedding. What appeared to him to be apple juice was not apple juice. You didn't know, son. And he was like, blah. He didn't like it. Hallelujah. But what appears to be, so appearances can be deceiving. So if it looks to be evil, we need to stay away from it. We need to be very, very careful. And why? Why all these things? Why these seven steps? Seven is number of, of completeness, number of perfection. All right? And so we see these seven things that God has shown us to, to help us in our spiritual walk, in our spiritual warfare. Why? Because the very next verse is, and, I, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Listen to this. He says, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he tells us all these things. All our triune being, our spirit, our soul, and our body, all are preserved in this way. He tells us this, and the scripture is full of that. To know that our our body is our flesh, our soul is our being. The word comes to psyche, is the the Greek word, is psyche. And that means our our mind, our will, our emotions. And our spirit is our very life, and it's what is sealed. There's what is sealed there. Our spirit is sealed unto the day of redemption. That's what he said. It said, all be preserved unto the coming of Christ. So there are seven things that we can look at, seven things that we can, we can take note of and try every day to rejoice, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks even in adversity, to make sure that we never quench the Spirit in our walk. Because 
through our testimony, we can quench the Spirit's working because the Spirit might be working in something and by our testimony, we cause them not to be saved. We have quenched the Spirit. Despise not prophesyings. What the Bible says, it says. Mm -hmm. It was a difficult verse. The Bible says what it says. To prove all things, to go and to study it, to prove it, scripture upon scripture, not scripture upon books, but scripture upon scripture, not scripture upon logic, but scripture upon scripture, precept upon precept. Mm -hmm. And abstain from all appearance of evil. Now these only work if we are saved. If we are saved, these will work and these will do that and it will help us and even more so when we've gone through deliverance it will help us more and more with these things but if we're not saved these things you cannot rejoice you cannot really pray you can make an attempt to pray but God does not uh, necessarily hear you right. because you're right. not one of his children right. salvation is is the first step in all these things and it's uh, we must must be saved yeah. uh, from these things to to be able to do these things we must be our soul our spirit must be saved born again our gracious